Hi from Sweden. Oh my Hello. <laughs> How are you doing today? I am doing great. I'm excited. It's been an amazing summit so far. So thank you so much, Polly, for just putting this together. Incredible, incredible work. Thank you. Thank you so much. That means a lot. I mean, one, I'm just like so honored to like be in conversation with you. You're like one of my favorite people and inspirations and you have no idea. Thank you. I'm like, Feeling oh. is mutual. Feeling is mutual. <laughs> Yes. I'm like, one day I'm going to have to go to Stockholm and one day because to meet you because I really am just honored. Um, so thank you so much again for taking the time. I mean, people, y'all, we're going to be in for a treat today. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you um, again to Adobe Lightroom for making this summit possible. Um, so, Lo, I know you prepared something special for us. Yes. Is that yes, correct? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I actually presented, uh, I created a presentation. So, um, but, uh, you know, the talk is going to be about finding and using your own unique, extraordinary voice, you know, and I yes. think it's for many of us where if we're still trying to find what's my visual voice as a photographer, how do I find my own unique way of seeing the world? Hopefully the presentation is going to, you know, uh, help. So. I love it. I'm so ready for this because as you said, like as photographers, as creatives, wherever we're starting at in our journey, whether you've been doing it for five years or 25, having that strong voice, being able to experience that, use it, even especially as women, as black women, I mean, as immigrants, it's hard. It is. So I'm going to just allow you to turn it over. Um, and then don't worry, y'all, we'll have plenty of time for questions as yes. well. Yes, I'll keep it quite not too long, <laughs> but let me share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so sharing and then amazing. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so I can only see the presentation. I cannot see you. So I'm just, you know, just I'm listening to your voice. All right. Okay. Perfect. So uh, my talk is gonna be about not only just finding, but using your extraordinary voice. And so I'm going to start with a story, all right? So many years ago, I was at a travel conference in London, and it was a conference where there were editors from different magazines, you know, and lots of writers and photographers there. And so I was sitting next to a, an, a middle-aged white woman, you know, she was there at the conference. We, we hadn't met before, you know, just total strangers. And so we started talking and she says, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a photographer. And she's like, really, where have you been published? And so I mentioned, you know, some of them, including National Geographic. And then she sits back and says, really? I taught you how to be extraordinary to be published by them. So this woman says this to me, total stranger, without knowing me or my story, right? So, I am a travel photographer. I've been doing this for over 10 years now. I will say about 12 to 15 years. And I focus on travel and culture, on getting to know people, but also breaking stereotypes of what a travel photographer looks like. Because that woman just looked at me, a black woman, and assumed I could never be a travel photographer. So I want to share a bit of my own background to see if, uh, you know, hopefully it inspires and my story is going to tell you how I found my own voice and uh, and where I am today. So, Polly, I can see you. Can you still hear me and see the presentation? Yes, my jaw okay. is still dropped about that woman. But... <laughs> no, we'll get, back, we'll get back to her. We'll get back to her. <laughs> so, um, so, I'm originally from Nigeria. I was born in Nigeria. And I lived there up until I was 15 when I moved to the U.S., and I went. To, I went, moved to the U.S. to go to school, studied there. Actually, worked as a programmer for many, many years before I became a photographer full time. And then I ended up in Sweden. But when I moved to the U.S., that major transition in my life, I was moving to a new place with new rules, a place that kind of wanted to predefine who I was as a black woman, as well as my narrative as a creative of what I was supposed to be doing or what I wasn't supposed to be doing. Society at that time didn't want to listen to my own story, right? And my own truth. 
society didn't want to do listen because i was moving in and society had already pre-crafted our narratives as black women for us creatives and i wasn't helping my case at that time i mean i was so eclectic in the way i was dressing i didn't care i was doing my own thing because i was my own person right my own person and so what happened i was i started getting branded as different and out of the ordinary ironically they used the word quote unquote extraordinary, but not in a flattering way. Because the word extraordinary means somebody that is out of the ordinary, somebody that is out of the box we create for them. And what happened? I became isolated a lot. I was isolated a lot because people tend to isolate what they do not understand or exclude what they do not understand. And so sometimes the source of our creative voice comes from a space or a place that was denied us. The source of our creative voice can come from a space or a place that was denied us. So isolation became the source of my creative voice. And I'll show, and I'll show you how that threads through all my work. And isolation is a very cruel place to be locked in against your own will. So that became the source of my creative voice because I wanted to, see, to be seen for who I already was. I wanted to exist in different spaces without explanation. And above all, I wanted to be listened to. I wanted to be listened to. And so what happened is what was denied me, which is giving the space to be listened to, giving the space to just be, I decided to give others through my work. So years of isolation, translates into the type of portrait photography I take. And I'll show you. Years of isolation translates into the type of portrait photography I take. Because photographing people means listening, truly listening, especially to strangers, right? Listening to both their verbal and non-verbal cues, giving them the time to say, I see you, I fully see you, what was denied me. And it is looking them in the eye and truly hearing what they have to say, right? So I am a travel photographer and I love photographing people, especially strangers, going up to strangers, creating that connection and looking into their eyes so that in that moment you see them fully for who they are, right? Without judging them based on the environment. And so I've traveled to over 70 countries on different assignments, I've met some amazing people, documented some amazing cultures, and the, and the thread that ties us all is that we all want to be acknowledged and seen for who we already are. Whether it's in Uzbekistan, the lady on the left, or in Serbia, the lady on the right, even in Nigeria, Nepal, looking in Wales, looking into your subject's eyes, and saying, you know what, I see you. So a lot of my work as a travel photography, especially when I focus on environmental portraits, focuses on that, looking people in the eye and giving them that, that time. So isolation is what gave birth to my creative voice, which is framed by listening when I travel. So how this translates into my work, right? As a travel writer and a photographer, the act of listening is what, and what they're trying to say is, is what drives the work, like I said. And so what I do is it keeps pushing me into spaces to keep normalizing, quote unquote, nullified voices, right? On a mainstream level, saying that even though I'm breaking that stereotype of what a travel photographer looks like, because most people still think professional travel photographers look like white dudes that just came down Everest and then go modeling for GQ. No, they can also look like me as well, right? So in my travel writing, when I put on that ad, I let my characters describe themselves as an observer. And in the photography, I capture that moment of connection in the eyes of my subject. And most portrait photographers know that moment I'm talking about, where everything else stops and it's just you and your subject looking into each other. It's that moment, you see each other fully. 
And that is what I live for when I travel. That moment where we recognize each other and we fully see each other. You see it in the eyes. No matter where I go, right? And for me, it's about showing people how they are so that they are not defined by the environment or their, or their circumstances. So if I don't tell you this, but the guy on the left came into Sweden as a refugee and I was working for two years on a photo project with an asylum center, just taking portraits of the asylees so they just have their photos. I wasn't really publishing those photos publicly. It was just to say, look, this is who, this is you. I'm looking into your eye and your situation, your background, your circumstances does not define you as a person. You, This is you, right? So looking in people's eyes. So just going back to what I said, you know, my work is a visual representation of the words I see you. Yeah, I see you. And so I've been fortunate and grateful and blessed to have been tra to have traveled to so many amazing places and met so many amazing people in different cultures and it's easy to get invited in even meeting strangers once you acknowledge them once you say you know what i see you call them by their names call them often by their names because one of the hardest parts of travel photography is not, I always say it's easy to set up a tripod and put a, and create an amazing landscape photo. It's very easy. It's very difficult to go up to a stranger and put your camera in their face and say, you know what? I want to take your portrait, right? So as a travel photographer, how I measure my progression on the road as I travel is how quickly I can connect with people as well because sometimes I have to move through a space quickly but how quickly I can connect and genuinely and authentically as well right and it's those ordinary interactions with strangers I meet is what makes my stories quote-unquote extraordinary right so just spending time with people listening to them And I always say that as a photographer, the moment I ask someone to take their picture, it, it doesn't become, it no longer becomes what I want, but what that person is willing to give me of themselves. What that person is willing to give me of themselves. And that is what changes the dynamic when I travel. It no longer becomes about what I want to bring back, but what that person is willing to give me of themselves. So I just have a few more slides soon, whether it's, you know, fishermen in the Seychelles going out, pulling uh, traps with them. And so in terms of my visual voice, my photography is very vibrant and I love a lot of contrast. So a lot of shadows, the colors and really vibrant colors. And that's because that's, I used to be an oil painter. Many people don't know this oil painter. I used to be an oil painter. So a lot of that comes through my work but also that's what my eyes see, you know, as an African uh, photographer, you know, I, I grew up with a lot of vibrant colors, a lot of contrast, dark skin against blue sky. So that's what my eyes also sees. And that's why it's important to diversify who gets to tell stories of a place, who gets to bring back visual stories of a place. Because what I would see, what I will bring back as an African also makes you know, it just kind of creates a more wholesome portrait of a place as well, in, instead of just the same view going to the place. So these are just some of my photos from, from different parts of the world. And one of the things I always get that a lot of my colleagues don't get as a, as a travel photographer is, did you take that, right? So the, somebody could be phoning next to my, colleague who might be a white guy and say, oh my God, your photos are amazing. And then when they come to my photos and they see it, I'm like, oh, did you take that? Then that means I could take that too, just assuming. And you know what? You can, 
because the photo on the right, I actually shot with an iPhone 5. So sometimes it's not always about the gear you have, but it's about developing your eye, your compositional eye, the way you process the world as a photographer as well. So the photo on the right is actually shot with an old iPhone 5 lots, uh, many years ago. So uh, in 2018, I was named the Bill Muster Travel Photographer of the Year, and that was a huge honor for me because I think it was probably historic because I don't think there was there had been any black, you know, travel photographers that won that award. But it was also again opening that space so that people can see themselves reflected in me to say, you know what, if I can get into the space that's been traditionally held by white guys, then it's open for me because I have my own visual voice, my own visual style of processing the world, and you can come into it. So that's what I've been doing a lot of. So to kind of start wrapping up this presentation, I want to share my absolute favorite quote. It's from it's by E.E. E. Cummins, and it says, to be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best, night and day, to make you like everyone else, means to fight the other's battle which any human being can fight. Never stop fighting. Never stop fighting. So to wrap up, you know, the space that was denied you is where you might be able to find the beginning embers, the flickers of your creative voice. That's why activists, you know, champion a cause because most of the time that cause has affected them. That cause is a personal source of pain, you know? And so for me, that's why cultural connection is at the root of everything I do because isolation, we isolate each other because we don't understand each other. So all my work, ties, cultural connection, trying to create bridges of understanding, of seeing different perspectives, right, underpins everything I do. So that lady that told me that I taught you how to be extraordinary, you know, to be published by National Geographic, what I told her then was this, that you need to be able to tell a good story, right? That was what I told her then. What I, what I will tell her today is different, right? <laughs> what I told her then is, you have to be able to tell a good story, a good visual story, because how could she see me as extraordinary if she didn't even see herself as extraordinary, right? And I'm quoting one of my, my friends and mentors, Yomi Abiola, absolutely amazing human being. She says, people can only see as far for you as they see for themselves. And that is why they create boxes and limitations around you and your talents and what you can do, right? So if I could travel back in time, what would I say to that woman? This is what I would say. Who says I'm not extraordinary? Who says I'm not extraordinary? So that is my presentation. Let me stop sharing my screen and pop back in. Oh my goodness. Where do I even begin? <laughs> what? I <laughs> Someone said, where is your TED Talk? Oh, <laughs> I do have a TED Talk, actually. <laughs> it's, it's called why. It's called the power of asking why not. When people ask you, why do you want to do something? Why then? Why not? Why am I not allowed to do it? Give me a reason. So <laughs> I'm just blown away. I mean, first, I'm going to need to replay this whole presentation <laughs> to remind myself because, yes, like, those limitations, I mean, we put on ourselves that are already put on ourselves, and then we then have that ingrained. But who says? Yes. Like, who's, yeah. How did you develop that, just, you know, the confidence and just that, you know, like literally just be able to know and recognize that voice for yourself? How did you right. develop that over time? Correct. And, and so, you know, going back to to that kind of source of pain i mean most creative people know they're always they're creative you know they know, whether it's writing or photography or painting so i've always known i was a creative person but jumping into photography when i started uh travel photography it was more to just take a photo and come paint it but it was when i started feeling this uh feelings of isolation of being treated and marginalized like, well, you don't fit in this box, so you're weird. You don't fit there, so you're weird. Then I said, you know what? If I'm feeling this, then a lot of people are feeling this as well. And it usually comes to just stopping, taking a moment to truly listen to each other. But also, how can we create that bridges of understanding? Because we're a lot more common 
then we are different, right? So how do we connect on our uh, similarities first? So we can then have the space and bandwidth to listen to our differences. And so for me, I already knew that this was going to be something that was good. I just didn't know what form, but I knew this was going to be part of my purpose because I had felt this and I, I feel deeply. <laughs> and I knew that other people were also struggling. And when you go, when you, especially when you travel and you look into the eyes of people that are being misunderstood, disrespected, then I say, oh, what can I do? How can I show the world the way you want to be shown to the world? Right? So, yeah. So it's, uh, and, and I think once you, once you find that voice and then you find your cause, then your voice only gets louder when you keep recognizing the source of pain. Because it's like, if you see the source of pain trying to push you back into the box, you're going to scream like, no, I recognize this. So your voice amplifies and gets stronger. So, so yes. <laughs> I'm still processing. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard it told in that way and the, yeah. you're just so calm and so sure and it's just so beautiful like oh, I mean you. I was telling you earlier I mean the joy already exudes like the extraordinariness of you <laughs> exudes anyway thank you. so <laughs> thank you well, but everybody and that's the thing everybody has their extraordinary voice you right. know sometimes we just don't know where it is and once you've there's so many ways you, your voice can grow, but sometimes you may want to look at a space you don't want to look at, something mm -hmm. that's maybe been a, the source of pain, because that's where sometimes your most powerful work can come, because you've experienced this, or this was something you felt, and that's why I keep going back to activists, right, where they champion a cause, because that cause has been really, that was their source of pain. So, mm -hmm. so that's just, so I'm just giving you one more avenue to look at mm -hmm. if you're still finding your voice. You know, as a woman, as an African woman, how were you able to really just keep that, just that push, that fire within you to go? I mean, you mentioned everyone in the, the chat was laughing about the GQ part. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. So, because it's, it's yeah. a when you are constantly <laughs> dealing with that, I mean, you yes. were probably, you were, I mean, probably dealing out with that more than you have ever shared with anybody. Wow. How did you just like keep going in that exactly. regard? Exactly, and, and, and it's very difficult, especially when you're doing this with no resources, yeah. with no support, you know, with no community where people just get, you know, like the GQ looking travel photographers just get everything to just get, make their work. And then you are working twice as hard. And sometimes you go to the, um, you know, photo editors who also mm -hmm. may have their own implicit bias because you don't look like a like a white dude, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult. But at the same time, I am somebody that is a very tenacious person, especially when I know, when I have my eye on a goal and I know that this is what I'm called to do. I keep fighting. I keep pushing. I, I push through rejections, you know, and I keep walking because I know that what I'm doing it's not just for me. I'm trying to break mm -hmm. a space for Black women, for women of color, so they can move into that space. Because travel photography is still, you know, be beyond, you know, um, just Insta. I call it like Instagram or traveling and posting photos on Instagram. Going on an assignment, shooting and illustrating a magazine, I, you know, I profile. It's it's very different. And I'm trying to break that space open because a lot of us can do it. We can do it. We're just not given mm -hmm. the opportunities. And I always quote Viola Davis because she's incredible. Yes. But she said the difference, the difference mm -hmm. between Black women and other people is opportunity. Opportunity, we are brilliant. There's a reason why they say that Black girl magic, excellence, because you are working so hard with limited resources. Now, imagine if you are backed with the resources you need to be brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. So so that, so when I see so when I think of that, that just keeps me going. Just keeps me going because we have a lot of work to do. And mm -hmm. Polly, you've already started this work incredibly. So just thank you. Thank you just for all what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I mean I mean when I see you and others, you know, who've done it <laughs> again with nothing. Yeah. I mean, it's for me, it's like, what excuses do I have? I'm going to find yes. a way. Yeah. Um, I want to go yeah. back. I want to go to your work because, yes. I mean, 
there was so much conversation in the chat just about the empathy, just the humanity in your work. Um, you. Somebody commented how you made everyone so personal in the eyes. Yes. I mean, everybody that you came across, no matter, like you said, they're a refugee or whoever, you treated them the same, you captured that the same way. And I think within just like travel or just photojournalism or street photography, there's a lot of conversations about just consent and yes. just the ethics of it. Yes. You know, so how did you, I mean, like you already mentioned about you capture them the way that, oh, or however they invite you into their world and space. Uh, yes. So I guess, you know, my question then is for you, like, how would you advise others to do the same? You know, how have you seen just, because I feel like we said I have these conversations over and over and over again. And I'm like, but now how do people not approach it like the way you approach it? Correct, correct. Because I mean, and there's so many levels to this conversation, right? Yeah. So even when we talk about modal releases, you know, even if, so let's put modal re releases aside, right? Because we know we need those for commercial photography and different things. Let's just talk about just photographing strangers. You can already tell in the disposition of the person if they gave you permission or not. You can easily tell in a photo. And that is why I don't sneak shots. I, when I started out, you know, I used to be like, oh, street photography, let me zoom in. And I'm like, you know what? Let me put myself in the shoes of the person. If the person is the main subject of the photo, then we need to stop sneaking shots of them. If they're kind of part of a little element and you're capturing maybe how light moves in, that's different. And so I started moving up, getting closer to people, acknowledging people. And one thing I always say is, um, a lot of people say they are afraid of photographing strangers. And I'll give you two, the two reasons why. One is obviously because of rejection, you know, and two, shame, because they don't, they usually don't reject you in private. They reject you in front of everybody, like, get out of there, get out of my face, you know, and then there's a crowd and then you, and then you're, you're ashamed. But, but what we're doing is we're putting our own emotions ahead of the subject. And that's what I said. The minute I'm walking up to somebody, that relationship immediately switches because now I'm asking them to give me something. So it's up to them to say no and reject me, right? And so just even going up to people, basic acknowledgement, calling people by their names, calling them by their names often, that's the simplest way to say, I see you, right? That, and, and it's interesting how a lot of photographers don't do this, especially when they travel, travel photographers. It's just they set up the shot. They want it. They focus more on the artistry of the shot. I don't do that. I focus more on just the person and the moment. I could set up the artistry. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I used to be a painter. I know how to kind of make everything really for, beautiful, you know, if I wanted to set it and stage it. But for me, it's about the person so that when you look into their eyes first, you see them before you look at their environment and judge them. So, so there are so many levels to the, to the discussion as well. So. That is true. Um, and just in terms of like the technique, just like the legality of it all. And there was a yes. question about, um, do you like, after you have the verbal consent, that verbal permission, do you then follow it up with a written consent or how do you It depends. It depends on what I want to use the photo for, right? So if I, so most of the photos I take, they're in an editorial context, you know, maybe for travel magazines. So you don't really need a, a release for that. If I want to sell a photo, maybe into an image, but like maybe not an image, yeah, into an image bank or into like for advertising or for branding, then I have to get a model release. Then from the very beginning, I really fully communicate what this is about. And then they can say yes or no. So it really depends on the assignment. It depends on the context. And when I take a, a photo in, a, in one context, I don't go sell it in a very different context. You know, so like if I take a photo of somebody eating in for an interior con uh, context, then I don't go sell it in a commercial concept you know, where they can use it to advertise somebody else's food without getting, you know, a, a release from the person. So it really depends on what you want to use the photo for. If I'm publishing it in my own books, you know, in terms of showing my work, I don't need a release for that. And it also, and that's why it goes back to also body language, you know, at the same time in that moment when the person is interacting with you, because you can already tell if this person does not want to engage with whatever you're trying to do, you know, you can tell it. So 
Absolutely. Um, I also want to talk about, you know, the fact that you've been to over 70 countries. That is yes. incredible. I stopped counting, but but I have been to a lot. I, I, but I have been to a lot. And, and to... No, that is incredible. But can you talk about, you know, when you are, there's a question in the chat um, from Bunny about just when you're traveling and being a woman, being yes. black, being African, mm. like, how do you travel safely to all these places? How do you navigate yes. that? Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And I think even as a black woman, just the spaces you move from, you know, some parts of Europe, they already see you as, oh, black woman, prostitute, let me get close to you and bug you. You get that to some places where they just are outright hostile to some places that actually maybe I've not even seen a black woman before. And I'll give you an example. In Uzbekistan, I was there on assignment working on, on a project with Intrepid Travel. And by like the third, fourth day, I was really exhausted, absolutely exhausted because everybody was coming to ask for photos with me because they hadn't seen a black woman. And so I said, okay, what's going on here? Because everybody, you know, people have TV, you know, people watch. But then I realized the government wasn't really granting visas to mostly uh, African countries or, or countries with, with mostly black populations. So that's why, you know, if I'm, if I'm traveling on my Nigerian passport, I probably wouldn't get a visa to Uzbekistan. So I had to go with a different passport, right? And so a lot of times it's not so much the people kind of being, um, you know, just the way they're engaging with you, but sometimes it's just the, the situation where maybe there's no opportunity to interact. I was exhausted, but I said, you know what? I know it's not my burden to bear, because well, individuals, but that means if I'm the last black person they see, I want that experience to be memorable <laughs> for them. Because it's like, I feel like I'm traveling behind every bad stereotype that has been perpetrated on our behalf to just keep, no, 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 because, you know. But, um, but in terms of staying safe, again, street smart, making sure you have local contacts, making sure, you know, you're smart about going around alone at night, uh, just the basic common sense we would use in the US, you use abroad as well. But also um, being, if, even when I travel, I try to tone down even my, especially when I'm carrying gear, because chances are they tend to ignore you. They don't think you're carrying gear. You know, they target more, you know, like maybe white tourists or white travelers or photographers. But again, just toning down my appearance when I'm traveling on assignment so that I don't draw attention, especially, you know, carrying gear and stuff like that. But there are so many ways, you know, to make sure that you travel safely, but also being respectful as well when you move in spaces, because remember, you're always the guest in somebody else's culture. So you want to move with respect and grace uh, through somebody's culture. So. No, absolutely. When you are doing something like for a personal project or you want to go to, I don't know, Accra, Ghana or something, yes. or just your own body of work, do you try to make contacts beforehand? Um, how, what, how, what, how, you know, prepared are you beforehand? And then, Correct. and then what can you do when things come up that you can't be prepared for? How do you navigate Correct. that too? No, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I can talk into context, right? So, one on if you're going on assignment to a place and then two if you're just going for your personal project right so if you're going on assignment obviously you want to make sure that you have all your local contacts you set up your itinerary most of the time you're going for a shorter period of time and so you want to have that planning right but you also want to keep communicating to your editors because with travel photography when you travel especially for a magazine they they want probably beautiful blue skies of the place. But if it's like bad weather all days, you know, you have to be able to communicate, you know, and being able to switch your theme on the fly, right? So if so, if everything is super like moody or bad weather, then you might be able to say, you know what, this is the uh, ambient, you know, ambience of the place and then capture more low lit situations and, you know, indoors. If you are going on a personal project, you should always, and I always say this, always first of all, have a local contact, somebody you can reach to that you can, especially if it's a place you, it's very, maybe that's very new to you. I mean, when I was in uh, Accra, Ghana, I actually went on assignment. That was for Marriott uh, hotel chains. They were uh, 
right at the beginning of the pandemic, they actually just launched their magazine, their kind of new magazine. And so I was I went to shoot that inaugural issue. And so all of that you plan ahead. But if you're working on personal projects, again, having local contacts, but also listening to the people who live on the ground. So when you come in, you have your own idea of what you want to work on. But somebody can down, you know, that lives there says, hey, wait, have you even tried this? Wait, let me take you to this hidden spot. That is how most of the best, not photography, but travel stories, you know, when I'm writing, come about when you listen to serendipity, listen to people, let them take you to some of their favorite places, give you ideas. Then you then you get closer into the culture as well. And then one thing I also always say is. Even though as a travel photographer, you need to be able to shoot everything, having uh, points of interest can actually help you get deeper. So for example, if you like music, then just going in to go uh, learn a lot about a culture through its music can actually get you deeper through one vertical than surface level all across. So sometimes it's better to just get deeper knowledge into culture through one thing than trying to have a, a broader kind of, I know everything, you know, uh, surface level, so. What, what has traveling, you know, taught you the most about your own self? Like, what have you learned from your experiences? And then, you know, going back to the theme of voice, like, how do you even just navigate just maybe language barriers mm -hmm. when traveling to these different countries yes. and still maintaining your voice? <laughs> yes, well. yes. So, so one thing I've learned, about travel is I no longer like first impressions. I do not like first impressions because first impressions force us to be one dimensional human beings when we're in fact multi-dimensional complex people. So I could meet you on a day when you're off and then to judge or to create or to put you in a box based on one experience doesn't make sense. So the more I travel, the more I realize I do. I just, this whole concept of always make a good first impression. Why? We're all beautifully complex. We're all messy. Uh, we're allowed to have one messy day and then the next day, right? And, and this is something that permeates uh, business a lot. That first impression, that first impression, that first impression. So the more I travel, the more I realize that just doesn't, because I've met people that have been crappy in the morning and by the end of the evening, they've learned, they've, They've brought me into their houses, you know, they've, you know, fed me, you know, I'm hanging with the family, right? So, so that's one thing, uh, travel. And then the other question was with the voice, right? Yeah, what was it yeah. even just like maintaining your voice, but just also a practical question, like the language barriers. When yes, you... language barrier, language barrier, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So it really depends. I mean, first of all, learning just a few basic words, you don't have to, like when people say, oh, learn, you know, full statements. <laughs> you, you can't learn full statements, but um, you can learn, you know, hello, thank you, just some basic words. If you are working with a local inter guide, absolutely, you know, the guide uh, interacts, but sometimes, there are so many places that I have moved that we know we don't have any language in common, but body language, eyes, talk, your hands, mm -hmm. your height, you know, there are so many things you can communicate with somebody. And that's why body language matters. You can look somebody in the eye, you can put your hand on your chest, you can ask, you can smile. There are things you can do to communicate. Even when you want to take a photo, you can lift, you know to ask, the, you know, they say, no, you thank. There are many things you can do non-verbally. Mm -hmm. And there are so many places I have been where there was just no language, but by, but by listening to them, you know? And when I say listening, they're gonna tell you through eyes, through words, to pointing, to describing, you know, what mm -hmm. they're trying to say to you. So, but at least try to learn just the basic, hello, thank you, you know, please, sorry, just some of those basic things. I just, I mean, all of this is just such great practical advice. I love it. Thank you. Um, I also want to ask you, you know, I mean, one, I feel like everyone maybe have that dream to travel the world mm -hmm. and get, and have that as your profession. I mean, you're someone who's done that extensively. Like you said, you, you lost count of how many countries <laughs> you did. But how did you turn that into an actual career, actual yes. way to get that, you know, pay the bills at the end of the day? Yes. Yes. How did it, how did you do that? 
Exactly. So travel photography is one of many things I do. So even though I am a professional travel photographer, I am not a 100% that is my only source of income travel photographer because it's very difficult. Most travel photographers actually do, even though they travel and we shoot for different magazines, we do other things on the side that actually brings more money in because most publications don't pay that much. You know, so you either you're teaching courses, you know, you're running photography tours. But how I got in was this very early on, um, just taking photos, National Geographic had a community, and I think they might have stopped it, but it was called Your Shot, where you could upload photos in, and then every day the editors pick like their daily dozen. And so very, very early on, they used to do that. And so I used to just put in photos. And then my photos got picked three times, just three times randomly out of thousands of photos, which to me said, my, my photos actually have a voice, like they actually sing something, you know, it's not just a pretty photo, maybe the, it's a photo that actually has something to say. And so from there, I started pitching. And my very first uh, kind of like photo essay was actually for BBC, with no experience. I had just been to, you know, I'd been to Nigeria, I'd spent some time in the fishing community. Uh, I came back with photos of, I, and I think one of the photos was a lady kind of holding, you know, a monitor lizard, lizard that I showed. So some really great photos from there. And I just pitched it, you know, as a story. And I always say, what's the worst that could happen? They just ignore your email, but what's the best? They email back and say, oh, that's a great story. So you have to be audacious. So that's what I did. I was just audacious. I was just pitching to the big publications. I'm like, I have no experience. I don't care. I know how to take photos and I know how to tell a story. And that is how it started. Because coming with your unique stories, especially stories and subjects you're interested in, comes true. It, you can communicate that. It comes true in, in your pitches, in your work. And so that's kind of how it started. And that's how I started getting into different publications as well including um, I was before National Geographic shut down the agency, the image collection, you know, I actually got signed and they represented me. And so my work is still in the, in their image collection. So, and I'm also a contributing photographer with Traveler in the UK, right? But that's how it starts. You know, it's just being audacious, having, you don't pitch. And, and I want to throw this in because this is super important. Um, a lot of photographers, especially landscape photographers, shoot amazing epic shots, but it's one epic shot. An epic shot doesn't tell the full story of a place. As a travel photographer, your, your work is to kind of capture a sense of the place, of what it feels like to be there. So even though I may love landscape photography, I need to be able to photograph people, street, markets, details, food, low light, everything to be able to sell a story because that's how you get in. You sell a story. You don't sell just the one epic image. It's very difficult. And so that's kind of how, you know, I, I started building my expertise and uh, I guess my career in this space. So, yes. Oh, that's just incredible. Um, and Thank when you. it comes to just like on that same line, how does one even price? <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you, like, you know, we always talk about rates and the importance of setting, like, in other ways, but, like, yes. how do you even price yourself? I guess it's different between editorial, commercial. Yes, it is very different. It is very different. Commercial, marketing, that's where the money is. Mm -hmm. Editorial, it's just prestige of the publication. They don't pay that much. They know themselves. They know they don't pay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so most editorials, they have their set rates, what they pay for, like, you know, a double page spread, a cover, multiple. So they have that, you know, and that doesn't usually change. So it's for you. And that's why most of the travel photographers do it on the side for those publications. They don't, you know, they, they do a lot of work in more commercial spaces. I do a lot of work in commercial spaces as well, you know. So, and I've, I've worked with, uh, with uh, different brands as well. So, but the pricing definitely definitely varies with editorial versus commercial. Editorial, you're going just more for the name prestige of the publication, but that's not what's gonna pay your bills, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and and commercial and brand, that's where you get you get the money. But it's very difficult to price, it's not. And this is one thing, that a lot of uh, travel photographers don't do. Many destinations have image banks. So an image bank is 
kind of like a, an image library that the destination uses to sell itself, to promote itself to different publications. So that's also how I got my name out is because mm -hmm. I sold a lot of my images to these image banks and the image banks, they pay well for photo for one photo because they want to be able to license that photo for free for publication. You still have the license, so it's a mutually non-exclusive. So you can still sell that photo to many other people but in their image bank, they want to be able to say Lola Akimade slash Sweden dot SE, you know, mm. this is, and then lots of publications use those. So that's how you also keep getting your name there. And if you set up Google Alert, you're like, oh, what's Yahoo, <laughs> what's Yahoo in uh, Japan doing the photo of mine? You know, because it comes from the image bank. So you get tons of publication credits as well. They've paid for that image pretty well because they mm -hmm. want to use it that way. But then that image is still yours. You can still sell it to other publications or do whatever you want with it. So, so. And, that, and that's separate from like stock. Is that, yes. That's separate yes. from stock imagery? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's separate than stock because with the image banks, most destinations have, you know, like we say visit Sweden, visit, mm -hmm. you know, Britain. Mm -hmm. They all have their own kind of, um, they call it their press and media media banks where they have photos that they like to use to promote their destinations and so they usually pay well for those photos and no but yes so that's image banks you know you can get your photos in so i have mine in a few of them i have one like in for greenland i have some photos mm -hmm. in greenland and, and sweden and uh, costa brava and just some other ones but there are great ways to also get your photography out. And, and uh, another way, because I use Photo Shelter, I love Photo Shelter. Mm -hmm. That's where they store my own personal image bank. And just having your own personal image bank, sometimes Google finds that before your website. So as long as you, you know, SEO code, have, you know, the right keywords, then people can just search, I'm looking for a photo of this. And mm -hmm. then they come straight to my photo shelter image bank, you know, and then I can sell the photo maybe more than what like a stock agency could. So there are many ways to sell your work. And I actually do, I, I don't know if I, we're allowed to plug, but I actually do have a course like it's that I have in my academy <laughs> that teaches you how to sell your travel photography through different <laughs> avenues as well. So that is, uh, so that's one, one route, you know, you can do. That is amazing. Um, and speaking of just what you were saying earlier, how you find other ways to keep getting that money. <laughs> you are yes. so multi-hyphenated. I, I mean, you are, and I, I can't end this conversation without talking about your latest book that's right behind oh, us. Yeah. <laughs> the promo there. Yeah. No, it's actually always there because I do a lot of book club meetings and, and talk about the book. So it's always just there in the background, you know, at that yeah. <laughs> so but yes talk to us about the process of that you know how did this come to be um and what how do you even just like i guess with all that that you've seen you know traveling for years now 70 plus countries how do you even begin to tell those stories and sit down mm -hmm. and then tell your own story within that yes no absolutely i mean so you know going back to what i said my purpose is tied to cultural connection, right? Because when we isolate each other, because we don't understand each other. And so my first book is, which was self-published, is called Do Not. And that's a collection of travel stories. I wish I had a copy I could have shown, but that's a collection of travel stories and photos, kind of over 20 years of experience, right? So that book is the one, it's super dear to my heart because that's what shows some of the stories I've written as a travel writer and the photos I've used uh, to illustrate them as well. Mostly focused on culture. Then the second book is called Logum, The Swedish Secret of Living Well. Again, focused on culture. So that book deep dives into the Swedish mindset, into the culture, into this unspoken ethos and how it manifests itself in different contexts in life. So that when I move in as a new person into this culture, then I understand, again, cultural connection then I understand, then I'm not beating my head against the wall. And I start understanding these, these are parts that are cultural, these are parts that, I'm, that come from me, that come from here. And then the third book is fiction, right? 
it says, you know what? I'm actually a black woman in this space, in the Nordics. What does it, what does it feel like to be a black woman? And, and how can I self-actualize as a black woman in the US versus Europe versus the Nordics? Right, very different. And so I, I so this was a story that needed to be written. Um, I used to write fiction when I was younger, uh, as a teenager, growing up in Nigeria. So that was always my first love. And then I moved into nonfiction, you know, into travel writing, but I always wanted to go back to fiction and I was struggling, like, how can I write this? But then the idea came about and it's like, you know what? You've traveled the world. You know a lot about different cultures. You know Swedish culture. You know what it, it feels like to navigate the world in your skin as a black woman. You know the different dimensions of black womanhood. Why don't you just write that in a way that's very relatable? you know, that people can see themselves and most importantly, give us, us as black women space to make mistakes. Because I'm actually tired of being like a strong woman. I wanna just be, you know, I always say, I wish I had the privilege to be mediocre and I don't. And so this book is, is like giving us space to just say, you know what? These are things we want. These are things we desire. We're tired. We need to be taken care of as well both emotionally and mentally. And this book was inspired, and I'll kind of wrap up this book talk, but the book was inspired by a Swedish quote that I came about. So this quote says, the deepest well can also be drained. And when I, when I came across that quote, it really arrested me because black women are some of the deepest wells in society, if not the deep, deepest wells in society, the things we have to pull, the sources, the source of strength, we have to pull out every day, facing microaggressions, working twice as hard, being second guessed, everything. That well, those wells are deep, but they are also not, uh, they can finish one day. You know, it's a, it really is exhausting, you know. And so I wanted to write a book that kind of honors that and gives us space to just be and make mistakes and be human, so. Y'all, I mean, yes. <laughs> I mean, yes, yeah. yes, just to be. I just mean, to be, that's all I want to be. be. I just want to be. I'm tired of surviving. I want to just thrive. Yes. I'm tired of surviving. I just want to thrive. And I think most Black women feel that. Absolutely, so. absolutely. I mean, like you said, you've you've told countless stories, uh, been to countless places. Are there stories you feel like you haven't told yet? There's so many. I mean, there's so many. And and like I always say, you know, I don't have a favorite place. I just have favorite experiences, you know. Um, and that's what keeps it memorable. And I'll tell you two anecdotes, right? So I was in Uzbekistan. Uh, on this assignment, and I went to a border village called Ayat. And I see this old man, and I'm with the guide, and I say, you know what, this old man is wearing a beautiful purple robe. You know, it's kind of, it's fall, kind of getting low light. I'm like, can you please help me talk to this guy and tell him I want to take his photo, right? So we walk up to the guy, and the guy says, through my, my uh, guide interpreting, it's like, what's your name? This is, again, this is a border village Uzbekistan, Tajik, right there, the border between Uzbekistan and uh, Tajikistan. He says, what's your name? I say, my name is Lola. The, then the old man says, no, 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 what's your name? I'm like, but my name is Lola. He's like, no, but where are you from? I said, I'm, I'm from Nigeria, I'm African. He's like, then tell me what your real name is. And I'm like, and, and he's like, because since you're African, I know your name is longer and it has a meaning. And I'm looking at the guy, I'm like, is this guy a wizard? What's going on here, you know? And then I tell him my full name, Onwara Lola Olua. God's ways are wonderful, right? God moves in mysterious ways. That's the name, Onwara Lola Olua. And the guy said, yes, that's your name. Because I know your names, Africans tend to be long and they have meaning. And in that moment, in that village at the border, I felt seen, fully seen by this old man in this village, right? So that was kind of one experience. Those are the experience, those, those amazing moments that travel gives you, right? I never would have assumed in this space. 
And so there are many of those moments I've had, you know, I've, I mean, even with, uh, with Greenland, you know, uh, recently, the guy that, uh, the, the first African to go to Greenland, Tete Michel Pomasi, he just turned 80. They've been celebrating him, you know, in, in the Guardian, in different publications. And his book really, truly uh, inspired a lot of us, uh, you know, black travel writers and black uh, photographers. And so I went on assignment to, to, uh, to Greenland to kind of follow some of his steps, you know, for it was, the, it was published in National Geographic Traveler to follow some of his steps, you know. And the night before I was going to go, I called my dad, say, oh, I'm going to Greenland. Tete Michelle, you know, was the first African in Greenland. And my dad is like, oh, that's amazing. Did you know? I'm like, what? That your grandfather also went to Greenland in the 70s, like a decade after, because my grandfather was in shipping. And I'm like, what? And he's like, okay, safe journey, love you. And I'm like, what kind of news do you draw? What, what kind of news is that? So now that's something I want to explore, right? Like what? Did my own grandfather also go here at like a decade after this man whose footsteps I am following that could also be like my grandfather, right? So travel is just, um, travel is an incredible, incredible opportunity. But I also say travel itself is not the passion. It is something, the passion is what allows you to choose travel as the avenue to live out that passion. Because I always say your passion is something you can do whether you travel or you don't travel. Travel is just the avenue that you use to live out that passion. So, and my passion really truly is cultural connection and making sure we get to understand each other better. That is my, my passion when I see and create and, and see that connection. So. I mean, I'm just so in awe. <laughs> I really am. Oh, thank you, thank you. I mean, I guess I have like two last questions. I'm yes, yes. In. I mean, Obviously, with this global pandemic, you mm. had it. I mean, we were all forced to stop and slow yes. down. What did you do in that moment? I yes. mean, how did you keep that, you know, passion and that feel when you couldn't go anywhere? Yes. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so when travel, I mean, my work is mostly in travel, right? And so when the pandemic hit, if you think of of travel as an avenue, then that tra that avenue was blocked. So now, how do you keep your passion alive? passion alive when the avenue is blocked. And so I always say, think about a stove. If you've got burners of different sizes, the biggest burner is travel. Your passion is the pot of water. You put it on the biggest burner, it boils it faster. But if you put it on even a smaller burner, it's still gonna burn, right? It's still gonna boil. And so moving your passion to a different industry or to a different avenue, even when travel stops, doesn't it, it's not going to fully drain you because that's that's your passion is not travel it's 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 what you use travel as the avenue right so when the pandemic happened i obviously couldn't travel much you know it's now starting up again i've got some assignments but i couldn't travel so i said what can i do so i spent a lot of time developing my academy to start teaching kind of some of the things i've learned over you know over the years and then i started a startup to say, you know what, a lot of people that were affected, the guides, the artisans, you know, how the, the, most of their money is spent, like comes in from tourism, but we can't travel. So what can we do to help create new sources of income for them? So we created this startup called Local Post that allows us to kind of virtually travel and live shop, you know, from the artisans. So that's another side project that we're slowly growing so that that can be a long-term kind of, um, you know, opportunity for, for guides and artisans. But again, tied to cultural connection. Everything I do, even though it feels like a lot, always has that thread. If it doesn't have that thread of cultural connection, I'm probably not doing it, so. Just, wow. I, I guess one of my final questions for you, you know, you've done so much. <laughs> Uh, we didn't get to like y'all. We barely scratched the surface. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, and you were most recently named, you know, at 2022 um, has about heroin as yes. well. Yes. You know, what do you want to do after this? Like, I mean, like, how do you even just like? I was I want to say like, what's next or like? <laughs> I know. I, know. I mean, like, it's an incredible honor. The Asoblad 
uh, being a, named the Asoblad uh, heroine is an incredible honor because now I feel I'm being plugged into the resources and the support that mm. I've been struggling to get for years. You know, like a lot of people are, are surprised when they find out, oh, you haven't had these, at this point in your career, you would have had all these brand partnerships. No, my friends, my white friends, they have them. <laughs> you know, I don't have them. Mm. And so this uh, as a blood uh, partnership is incredible. But also once you come into a space and you open up, you I call it the same names in rooms, right? So somebody has said my name in a room. So now I'm, I've been invited into the room and then you say more names in the room. You open up the space. And that's what I've been doing for many years, both publicly and as well behind the scenes, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm going to keep doing is to keep, even through my academy, also teaching, but also opening up the spaces. Give, like I And I do that, you know, I do that. I, I um uh, recommend names, you know, I'm, I'm sending any editors to different people, but just letting, and I, and I, and I, I, I call it the uh, adjusting the crown behind the scenes mm -hmm. as well. I'm like, oh, yeah. I, just, <laughs> no. <laughs> I do that a lot. Like, okay, now go. So, so, but just being, you know, um, showing, keep breaking barriers, you know, and also showing, because I also have a daughter and I want her to, to grow up in a space where nobody can tell her she can't do anything you know, mm. because she's a, she's, a woman, she's a woman and she's black, you know. And so just to keep pushing and breaking us, that those barriers, but also bringing people along, making it easier. For me, once it gets easier and easier for the next generation, then my work is done. That's, that's what you do. You, you do the hard work, you clear the path, you know, so that mm. it's, it gets easier and easier for the next. So that's what I, so that's what I'm doing, you know. I mean, you are making it easier for us. Absolutely. <laughs> you are, you are. Thank um, you. you know, any last, you know, words of advice you have for us, especially there's I, there's quite a few of us who are also African in this conversation yes. in the chat as well. You know, how can we continue to take up space and use our yes. extraordinary voice? Yes, no, absolutely. And, and just to speak into about the Africans, because you know this, when I told my parents I was going to be a photographer, they were like, <laughs> remind me you have degrees, oh. remind me you have degrees. Oh. <laughs> because, because there's this thing of like, I mean, now they're my dear supporters, but they still see it as, oh, maybe just a hobby at that time. Now, of, of course, it's different. But it's very difficult, but stay true to your voice. Stay true to your voice because people are going to push you to to live like your inauthentic self, right? The, people are going to do that, you know. You're going to get lots and lots of rejections, but those rejections keep staying true because your voice matters. Your voice really does matter. And one of the things I always say is you want to make your children proud, not please your parents, Right. Mm -hmm. somebody, somebody said, I, I, I saw that recently and I, I'm trying to find out, but it's like, it's not about pleasing your parents or changing your life to just keep or suppressing what you know you are born to do to please your parents. What you want to do is make your children proud or the next generation proud. You know, if, if so standing your truth, believe in your visual voice because you're unique and yes, your voice matters. In fact, in the book, I always say, that's that's the dedication your voice matters always you're allowed to exist without explanation so keep at it you know reach out poly has created an incredible uh community i am very accessible you can reach out to me as well but please now we have a community right that people understand what you're going through what you what you want to do so absolutely tap into your community as well so Thank you, thank you so much. I mean, y'all, this will be available on replay and don't worry. Because <laughs> you say TED Talk, I'm like, you already have a TED Talk. So. <laughs> no, but thank you. I mean, thank you all so much. Thank you for creating this space, Polly. This has been long overdue and I am so grateful for you and what you've done and what you've created for us. So thank you. Thank you all. Um, again, she has an incredible book. She'll actually be coming to the States soon for a book tour. Yes. Yes. Uh, so those who are not in the <laughs> in <laughs> internationally can actually come and maybe meet this iconic woman. So thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, you so you. much. Thank Lola. you all so much. This thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.